turning over the stimulus bill to Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid, I think went against Barack Obama's instincts. I think he knew that bipartisan, that he had one chance at a bipartisan approach to our current budget crisis. And I think that he hoped for the best, handing it over to Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid. In fact, I know this because in his book, The Audacity of Hope, this is what he wrote. These are Barack Obama's words. Genuine bipartisanship assumes an honest process of give and take, and that the quality of the compromise is measured by how well it serves some agreed upon goal, whether better schools or lower deficits. This in turn assumes that the majority will be constrained by an exacting and tough press corps and ultimately an informed electorate, and will be forced then to negotiate in good faith. If these conditions do not hold, if nobody outside Washington is paying attention to the substance of the bill, if the true costs are buried in phony accounting and understated by a trillion dollars or so, the majority party can begin every negotiation by asking for 100% of what it wants, go on to concede 10%, and then accuse any member of the minority party who fails to support this compromise of being obstructionist. He went on to say, for the minority party in such circumstance, bipartisanship comes to mean getting chronically steamrolled, although individual senators may enjoy certain political rewards by consistently going along with the majority and hence gaining a reputation for being moderate or centrist, unquote. This describes what Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid did to the stimulus bill. This literally describes it. Asking for 100% of what their special interest spending lobbies wanted, conceding 10% in the negotiations with the Senate, and then attacking any member of the minority party that voted against it as being obstructionist. Barack Obama wrote this. And unfortunately, he allowed this bill to get away from him. It got so bad, and this is behind the scenes, and I'm sure you have not heard this, Congressman Jim Cooper of Tennessee, who's the head of the Blue Dog Democrats, those are the fiscally responsible Democrats, he gave an interview in Washington 10 days ago in which he committed the ultimate political gaffe. And you know the definition of political gaffe. It's when someone in Washington inadvertently tells the truth. <laughs> this is what he said. Well, I probably shouldn't be telling you this. Always be careful when someone in an interview says, well, I probably shouldn't be telling you this, but I probably shouldn't be telling you this, but I actually got encouragement from the Obama administration for voting no on the stimulus bill, said Congressman Cooper. He was one of 11 Democrats to vote no on the original stimulus bill. The Obama administration knows it's a messy bill and they wanted a clean bill. Now, I get in terrible trouble with our Democratic House leadership because they don't care what's in the bill. This is the leader of the Blue Dog Democrats. They don't care what's in the bill. They just want it passed, and they want it to be unanimous. They don't want anything other than partisan fighting because that's what they're used to. In fact, they're really good at it, and they're a little bit worried about what a post-partisan future might look like, the kind of future Barack Obama talks about, because that might mean members actually had to read the bills and figure out whether they were any good or not. Now they can just tell people how to vote. We are all treated like mushrooms most of the time, unquote. That is the leader of the Blue Dog Democrats. Now, Speaker Pelosi at that point had two words for Congressman Cooper and they were not happy birthday. <laughs> and if, how many of you have seen the movie Star Wars? Darth Vader enters a room and there's some recalcitrant staffer there who's messed up and he just blows deeply into his air chamber and says, I find your lack of commitment disturbing, and then proceeds to throw him against the bulkhead wall. Well, I think that's what probably happened to Congressman Cooper because he revised and extended his remarks the next day and said that uh, he didn't mean them. <laughs> I assume there'll be a witness protection program if he, mis if he misbehaves again. Well, not to beat up on the stimulus bill, but I will. This is supposed to be our response to the challenges of 2009. But who wrote the stimulus bill? Well, let's see. We have such fresh and innovative thinkers as Appropriations Committee Chairman David Obey, who came to Congress in 1969. 1969. And ever since then, he's been actively pursuing pork and 1960-style infrastructure projects on the Appropriations Committee. Uh, then we have Transportation Chair Monster, I'm sorry, Chairman Joe, Jim Oguistar. He's age 70. He came to Capitol Hill in 1963 as a staffer. Stayed a few years, got elected to Congress, and has been there ever since. 1963. 
John F. Kennedy was president. In the Senate, we have the Appropriations Committee Chairman Daniel Inouye of Hawaii, who was elected to Congress the day Hawaii became a state in 1959. He's age 85, still going strong. It shouldn't surprise you then that the spending in this bill, regardless of what your political affiliation or ideology is, is old spending. It's old thinking. I have nothing against shovel-ready projects. There are certainly things, and we heard about this today from the professor from Ball State, there are certainly transportation bottlenecks, other things that could be helped and aided by old-fashioned infrastructure spending. But there's very little that's innovative here. In fact, if you look at the renewable energy sector, it's actually going to be hurt in large part uh, because all of the investment banks that used to invest in alternative energy because of the tax credits that were involved, if they take TARP money, they no longer can, give, can participate in those tax credits. So actually the alternative energy sector is, is actually going to be hurt by the stimulus bill. Now, this wouldn't be so bad if they'd actually read the bill. They didn't. Senator Lautenberg of New Jersey, a Democrat, admitted that not one single senator could have read this entire bill. To show you how bad it was, on Tuesday, the House of Representatives actually passed a resolution promising that the, every member would have 48 hours to read the bill after a final version was prepared. That was on Tuesday of last week. On Thursday at 11 p.m., the bill went up on the internet. Printed copies were not delivered until 6 a.m. in the morning. They went to the vote at 11 a.m. 11 a.m. This, I know this is sausage making. I know the old phrase, you know, you don't want to see laws being made or sausages being made. This gives butchers a bad name. This gives butchers a bad name. Now, will it work? Well, a little bit, but not nearly as much as promised. The Congressional Budget Office couldn't work fast enough to turn out its analysis of the bill. They didn't deliver their analysis until Saturday, the day after the bill passed. There's a reason why they were moving so quickly. The CBO analysis said, the bill will increase employment slightly in the short term, but will run up deficit spending, which will, quote, crowd out private investment in the economy in the long term, and ultimately shrink the gross domestic product. That's the Congressional Budget Office. Now, they said we had to pass this on an emergency basis. But if it was such an emergency, why did Barack Obama wait until yesterday to sign the bill? Couldn't they have given members of Congress Saturday, Sunday, Monday to look at it, pass it, and then he could have signed it into law? There's a reason. It wouldn't have passed if they'd read the bill. There would have been such outrage in the country. I mean, there, is, there are no earmarks in this bill, say Harry Reid and Nancy Pelosi. No, they're just member items. They've just changed the terminology. Harry Reid got $7 billion for a high-speed train from Las Vegas to Los Angeles. Nancy Pelosi got $30 million for her marsh mouse in San Francisco. Those are just two examples. Now, so they didn't want to let you read the bill. We already talked about the costs, how much it's going to represent. And at the end of the day, we've already been told that ultimately it's going to reduce wages and it's going to reduce GDP growth, although there will be a short-term goose. The, four, the third and fourth quarters of this year are going to be better. That's the good news. But we are going to pay for it, and our children and grandchildren are going to pay for it through much slower economic growth. Now, we were told that all of this had to be done so quickly because we have the 100 days phenomenon. Everyone harkens back to FDR's 100 days. And in the time of great crisis, how quickly FDR had to act in order to save the country from peril. FDR said he was doing this on behalf of the forgotten man. The forgotten man was the person who had lost his job. The forgotten man or woman was the person who couldn't feed their family. The forgotten man or woman was the person who was losing all hope, and therefore the government had to act. 